Okay, we can be more organized than that. Let's try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. That was way better. Welcome here to the First United Methodist Church in downtown Erie. I'm Pastor Jim Parkinson. We have all kinds of wonderful people in person with us today, and we know we still have some who are joining us uh, on Facebook Live. If you're there at home on Facebook Live, please go over to the comment field. Let us know of your presence, because it's the only way we have to know you're there. We're certainly glad to have, have all of you with us today. Uh, we do have a few announcements before we begin worship. First up, uh, we did serve uh, Sunday supper over at First Presbyterian Church of the Covenant last uh, Sunday evening. Uh, we served 39. By the way, we did set a record, but this wasn't a record nobody wanted to set. Uh, this was the lowest number of people served in anybody's memory. Okay. Now, it was, it was Mother's Day and it was raining. Both of those, I'm sure, contributed. But I can assure you, those 39 people who did get food were certainly very grateful. Um, that is the last Sunday supper that we're currently scheduled for. Our church, of course, usually cooks and serves at least two. And, of course, we host about a half a dozen when the uh, overflow homeless shelter is going on. And uh, we are in need of people to help with cooking. If that's something you feel God leading you to help with, um, it is Mary and Reem who coordinates our church together with First Presbyterian Church of the Covenant, but we are in need of people to cook. Say, we'll be doing about two meals each year. All right, next up, uh, city youth are going to be having their final get-together of this school year, this coming Friday. We are picking up from school at dismissal. That's technically 3.33. Uh, heading out to Susan's place, which is out in Northeast. Susan, of course, lives out in the country, has a huge farm pond in her backyard, picnic pavilion, paddle boats, uh, uh, canoes, everything. So we're heading out there on, uh, on Friday. And uh, the Reverend Bob Trask is coming up to join us, so he has a chance to meet the kids before they all disperse for the summer. Let's see. Um, yes, my retirement party is coming. Um, by the way, it's really fun to get to announce your own retirement party. But anyhow... If you want to come, you do need to make reservations. They have to be in by this Wednesday. Um, there is a kids carnival and parade that's scheduled for the first Saturday in June. Uh, Jim Ream is in charge. He's in need of all kinds of help. Uh, if you can help, please see Jim Ream. Um, let's see. Rummage sale is coming up the second weekend in June. Uh, today is the beginning, the official beginning of receiving rummage. I know people have been bringing things already. Um, and of course, there is always need for uh, additional help to both sort and organize and, and, uh, and put out in price. Of course, help during the sale itself and also help cleaning up after the fact. Um, okay, we have established a stained glass restoration fund. Uh, many of you know these stained glass windows were restored in the early 2000s. And uh, they were done at a cost of 100, including the big one in the back, at a cost of about $190,000. The one, one of the windows you can't see is the one on the north end of the bell tower is as bad as I was told this one was back when this was restored. So it is coming apart and, uh, and will eventually, it won't fall out and we'll actually end up falling inward. Uh, trustees have a, some, uh, some uh, outfits that they're dealing with on this. The guess is about $17,000, hoping to do that sooner rather than later. So if you do, uh, we have about 2,700 or so that's been contributed already to stained glass restoration. If you feel God leading you in that direction, uh, just mark your, your gift accordingly. Um, let's see. And then um, the annual shoe drive is underway. So you can bring new or gently used shoes, boots, sandals, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a tote downstairs for putting it in. Uh, I understand I was talking to Debbie Hills from All of God Children's Ministry. They shipped an entire truckload, uh, 18 wheelers, last week, and they get paid, I believe it's 40 cents uh, a pound. So this is actually, um, that those go off to, to third world countries. Uh, of course, the money comes back to both NUMA and All of God Children's Ministries. They're both United Methodist uh, ministries that happen, uh, that are headquartered right here in Erie. All right, uh, the last one is I just want to uh, make one, one little comment on all of the stuff that's going on between the CDC and the governor and everything else. If you are not confused, there must be something wrong with you, okay? Uh, and then I just got an edict from the, from the conference as well, and they're all diametrically opposed to one another. 
Okay, I, I, I'm going to tell you where we're headed, all right? Now, we already have a section over here for people who can, can safely uh, be seated without social distancing. Of course, the rest of the room continues to be configured for social distancing. The governor at the beginning of the week had told us that at the end of the month, okay, that the limitations on capacity and the requirement for dis distancing was going to be lifted. All right, that's what he told us. But mask, but we should continue to wear masks until 70% of the adult population uh, has been vaccinated. Here in Erie County, we're, we're at about 40% total population. I don't have any way to know the adults versus whatever. So at the moment, things are staying the way they are. All right, but as we move to the end of the month, okay, we will remove the physical distancing barriers uh, by the way, we have no problem with capacity. We're allowed to do 50% now. Believe me, this is nowhere near 50%. Um, other than that, we'll see. Somebody else will say something tomorrow, and some other official will say something the next day, and we'll all live totally confused. All I know is we're, we're fortunate now. About 80% of our congregation has actually been vaccinated among those that worship with us. There's no way for me to know that with high precision, but I do know it's about that. So anyhow, that's how we're going to try to muddle our way through all of the confusion. And uh, we thank you all for bearing with us. All right, let's prepare to worship the Lord our God today. As the light of Christ comes here unto our sanctuary and flows on into our hearts.
Good morning, everybody. It's great to see so many of you here today, so many faces, especially those who haven't been here for a while. We'd like to welcome everybody listening today on WERG 90.5 Gannon Radio and everybody on the web. If you please stand and join me in the call to worship. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It is through faith that we have been saved. Through faith, we are all children of God. Through faith, we are united. It doesn't matter if we're male or female, rich or poor. Through faith, we are all one in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn today is My Faith Looks Up to Thee. It's in the red hymnal, number 452. We'll be singing all four verses, and the words are on the screen.
And would you join me in the opening prayer? Lord, your greatness is evident in all the wonders of creation. Because of all your grace and love, you are worthy to be praised. Now in this time, Lord, we come to you and ask that you surround us with your kind, gentle, and empowering spirit. Amen. Come on, guys, I know you're here. James, you're going to be first. Hello, Brittany. Here comes Bert, he's coming up fast. He just beat Eric on, and he beat Claire. And your shoes sparkle today, too. Okay. Um, if we look up on the screen, I, I want you to think about a time when it's really noisy. If it's really noisy, are you able to think? Can you think when it's noisy? As a matter of fact, my, my wife used to think I was crazy because when, when we started, when I started in seminary, I had to read a whole lot. So I got myself these headphones that you put on where you can't hear anything because that was the only way I could concentrate on that dry stuff. Okay. Uh, anyhow, so it's really noisy. Let, let's, here's, a, here's an example of being really noisy. I want you all to try to think. Let, let, let's listen to this. Here we go. What do you think? All right. Do, do, Bert, do you think you can play that well? Maybe better, right? Give him some time. You never know. He'll be a great drummer when he grows up. Okay, and I have another one. This is my favorite. And Donna went nuts when I was uh, actually setting this up to get the video set up. So let's, here's another one. I want you to try to think. Here we go. Try to think. Try really hard. <laughs> was doing that? Not really. You couldn't pay any attention other than to that. Okay, these are some verses from our Bible lesson today. All the big people are going to help us read this out loud. All right? A mighty windstorm hit the mountain, but the Lord was not in the wind. Okay, one more. This is the sound of the windstorm. <laughs> Here's the sound of the earthquake. Who's ever been in an earthquake? Anybody? I know I never have. Okay, a few of you have. I have no idea what it sounds like. I've never been in one. Okay. That was an actual recording of an earthquake, I'm sure. Right? And then and the last verse. And the next to the last verse. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. This is a... This is a firemen here that have ever been in a burning house? Okay, that's actually a recording inside of a house that we put. Okay. And then the last verse. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle wind. One more. I will come to you in the silence. I will lift you from all your I claim you as my choice. Be still and know I am here. After all that noise, isn't the silence enough? Let's take another one. Gracious God, we thank you that in the noisiness of life, you give us quiet time, silent time. And that's when you come to us. 
that we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, guys. You've been so fun. All right, if you'll please take those friendship pads that are found on the center aisle end of your row. As you pass it through your row, if you happen to be with us for the first time, you'll find this card clipped in the front cover. Please take it, fill it out, tell us a little bit about you. You can leave it in there in the pad or drop it in the offering plate. You'll also find this little brochure clipped in the front cover. You're free to take one of those. It tells you a little bit about us. First, we ask everybody to record their presence with us today. Do this as legibly as possible. As most of you know, we're actually required, we're still required to keep track of who's here. By the way, I want you to look around. Is there anybody here that's going to tell you the name of everybody else who's here? Okay, you realize I have to do that every week. I have every single name marked up there. All right. Um, by the way, it's going to get interesting as we go through the transition, because if we're still required to do this when Bob Trask comes, I can assure you on his first Sunday, he's not going to be able to tell you who all, you, who all who of you are. So you're going to have to do a really good job of making sure you write your names very legibly on this pad. All right, again, the offering. Uh, join the offertory. You can bring it to the plate here in the center of the front or the center of the back. 
I know a few of you have a hard time getting around. That's okay. Just hand it to a neighbor. They'll take it. Hold it up. He's back there. He'll come and get it for you. So it is with joy and thanksgiving in our hearts that we give our tithes and offerings to God today.
Let's pray. God of the universe and God of our hearts, speak to us this morning in our giving with your still small voice. Remind us who we are. Remind us whose we are. Remind us why we have chosen to follow your son, Jesus the Christ. As we share our offering this day, remind us that when we feel like we are the last ones left, the last ones who have not turned from you, that we really are not alone. What we do and what we give, may it be multiplied with compassion for others. Keep us faithful in the knowledge. We pray this in the name that is above all others, Jesus the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Our prayer hymn today is God Will Take Care of You. We'll be singing all four verses. The words are up on the screen. God Will Take Care of You. Let's all bow together in prayer. 
merciful God. We know what it is to feel wearied and hounded like Elijah. We try to do the right thing, but we are unappreciated, misunderstood, and harassed for our efforts. We are tired of needy people. We're tired of being the responsible one, of shouldering the burdens of family and friends and co-workers, and yes, even of the church. We would like to run away as Elijah did, but what we really need is the grace of your presence. We need to remind it we are not alone. We long to feel the fresh breath of your spirit. We ache to hear, hear your still small voice whisper in our ears. We wait to encounter you in a thirst quenching, soul renewing way. Come to us, merciful God, to feed us with that food which only you can give because you alone can satisfy the deepest needs of our soul. Now, merciful God, we express thanks for our blessings as we lift up to you these our heartaches and sorrows. We come to you today, Lord, with aching hearts, thanking you for the life of Arlene Lanier. It really wasn't all that long ago that she was here with us in worship. She went into the hospital Saturday and went on to glory on Tuesday. We pray for Nancy and Steve and Jim and the rest of the family as they go through this time of mourning and loss and this time of adjustment. We thank you, Lord, for Arlene's life, and we pray, Lord, that comfort will be upon all of us. Also come to you today with some praise. We praise you that Pauline Ramos is back in her apartment. I saw her this week. Also praise you that uh, Jim and Mary and Reem's son-in-law, Mike Wick, is home from the hospital and continuing to recover. We also come uh, lifting up Kathy Leneve, who plays in the praise band in the early service, praising Lord, praying, Lord, that you're going to continue to stabilize her work situation. Then we come continuing to lift up our custodian, Alex Cheerpak, and his sister, Amber. Now, it's been a week now since their father, Mark, died off in Iowa, and they've been working on arrangements and are going to be bringing him back here soon. We also can, of course, uh, <coughs> lift up uh, a young child that Marcy Scott's asking this. This is Gabe uh, Sabina, just 10 years old, suffering from brain cancer. And of course, there are many others suffering from cancer. We pray uh, Bill and Mary Campbell ask prayer for their friends, Dolly, Tom, Sean, Lisa, and Linda. And then of course today, Lord, we come lifting up uh, Bob and Karen Trask as they continue to wrap things up there in Brockway and prepare to move out here to Erie. We pray, Lord, that that transition will go smoothly for them and for their six congregations there in Brockway. We also come thanking you, Lord, for the progress that's being made against this natural evil called COVID-19. And we continue to pray to you, Lord, that you're going to deliver us from this. And then uh, as we do each week, Lord, we pray for some of the kids, both in city youth, as well as some of our kids in our own congregation. Today, Lord, we pray for Hussan, for Jen, also for Elliot Sitter. Merciful God. Thank you for hearing our prayers, for caring for those for whom we've prayed according to their needs. Now let us continue in prayer by joining our voices together and praying that prayer that your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Bible lesson today is from 1 Kings chapter 19. I'll be reading the first verse through the beginning of the 15th verse. Of course, the words are up on the screen. 
and I invite you to listen to God's word. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he had killed all of the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. <coughs> he got up, fled for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servants there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He also asked that he might die. Is it enough now, O Lord? Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and he ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of the, that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now, there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone have left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day. Amen. There's an ancient tidbit of wisdom it's in the uh, book of Proverbs. It's one of those tidbits of wisdom that each of us should take to heart as we examine what it is we're doing and why it is we're doing it. I'm sure when I quote this, that, that most of you will immediately recognize it. All deeds are right in the sight of the doer, but the Lord weighs the heart. What this tells us just because we think we're right, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are right. A healthy dose of self-doubt should temper all of our actions. If it doesn't, we risk falling into another trap that's described by another one of those tidbits of wisdom. This is the one that's my favorite. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. The annual season of graduations is upon us. And the staple at every graduation is the graduation speech. Speakers tell us, you know, that if you apply yourself and believe in yourself, you'll succeed. Well, that surely is much better advice than telling people that if you just sit idly around and 
you know, you can freeload off your family and friends. I, I can tell you, this advice still makes me uneasy. Every time I listen to one of those speakers say, believe in yourself, go for your dreams, aim high. What they're doing is they're giving the graduate a green light to charge ahead in life. I, and every time I hear that, it reminds me of those tidbits of wisdom from Proverbs. And what I ended up doing, it ends up throwing up the caution flag. The Lord weighs our hearts. The Lord sees our underlying motives. The Lord gets the final say of what's right and what's wrong. Of course, we all know graduation speakers, they're not actually allowed to say that, even if that's what they believe. By the way, that's one of these many ironies of living in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and God will lift you up. Remember, the word confidence begins with the word con. We're all perfectly able of conning ourselves into believing whatever it is we want to believe. We do what we want to do. We think what we want to think. We even worship what we want to worship. We call it independence. But when we exclude God, independence takes on the stench of rebellion. We come, we come just like the little toddler, who's running just as fast as he can into oncoming traffic. Child might be having fun. Mom's absolutely terrified. This scene speaks volumes. What we have is we have two determined faces glaring at each other. They're waging a battle. On the right, we have the little boy who wants what he wants, exerting his independence. And on the left, we have the, the mother who knows far better than her child does. A rebellious spirit fills the child. Caring spirit fills the mother. Now, if the mother didn't love the child, she'd let the child do whatever he wanted. But she does love him, so she can't just sit idly by and let him stray off into harm's way. The analogy of the relationship between a parent and a child is one of the most powerful analogies we have for our relationship with God. God is our divine parent, and each of us is God's beloved child. Now, it's not that God doesn't want us to grow up and become productive members of society. In fact, that's the whole reason that God created us in the first place. But God does provide active resistance anytime we're venturing off into harm's way. Our Bible lesson today is yet another Old Testament story about the prophet Elijah. Remember, he was the successor to the prophet Moses. The commandments that God had given to Moses up on Mount Sinai, they warned the people of the importance of being faithful to God. Anybody remember what the first of the Ten Commandments is? Remember, you probably learned them when you were a kid in Sunday school or maybe when you went through confirmation class. What's the first of the great Ten Commandments? You shall have no other gods before me. Sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Don't cheat on God with other gods. And what's the second commandment? Well, it's one that's a lot like the first. You shall not make or worship idols. I think these commandments are crystal clear. Love and be faithful to God and life will be good. Ignore and cheat on God, and, and there's going to be hell to pay. Well, that's what the people of the northern tribes of Israel have done. They've cheated on God. Ahab, their king, had married a Phoenician princess, Jezebel, who enticed her husband to set up a temple to her god, Baal, alongside Israel's god, Yahweh. Ahab and Jezebel, they wanted what they wanted, and of course, they're king and queen, so who's going to stop them? They let another god come before Israel's god, and they set up an idol and worshipped it. This is a picture of an actual Baal idol that Donna and I saw when we were visiting at the 
Egyptian room over in the Cleveland Museum of Art. The thing's only a couple of inches tall. I'm pretty sure everybody else just walks right by and doesn't even notice it. But I immediately recognized what it was. Baal is a god of the powers of nature who's sometimes called the storm god. But earlier in 1 Kings 18, when Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal to a contest, Baal remains lifeless. While Yahweh rains down fire from heaven, consuming not only the sacrifice, but even the stones in the altar and, and even you know, evaporates all the water in the moat around it. Surely, this should convince Ahab and Jezebel of the folly of, of worshiping Baal. But they're still rebellious and stubborn. They want what they want. They were confident they were right. They thought they were in charge, but they were only fooling themselves. Yes, remember, confidence begins with the word con. And we can con ourselves into thinking that we're vital to God. Yes, people don't con, only con themselves into thinking what the bad they're doing is good. They also con themselves into thinking the good that happens couldn't possibly happen without them. I have witnessed this in church leaders and pastors. They start some ministry. God blesses the ministry, meets with some success. The next thing you know, it all starts going to their head. They begin to believe their own hype. They start to act like as if they're God's gift to humanity. Ministry grows. Number grows. Offerings grow. Buildings grow. Parking lots grow. The next thing you know, you have a mega church. During my lifetime, I have been a member of really small churches, less than a dozen people, really large churches, several thousand people. And sadly, during that time, I have witnessed ministry successes going to people's heads. Now, instead of talking about what it is that God has done, they begin talking about what it is that they've done. They will talk about how they grew their church from this tiny little handful of people to this entire stadium full of people. Now, they may give God some lip service along the way, but in their hearts, they're actually claiming all the credit for themselves. All I can say is when the mighty fall, they fall hard. And some fall in very public ways. I'm old enough, I can remember the falls of Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart back in the 1980s. More recently, there was the falls of Ted Haggard and Eddie Long. Each of these men was once a faithful servant of God. Something happened. They succumbed to the age-old temptation of the flesh. Somehow or other, they began to believe that the rules don't really quite apply to them. And one by one, each of them fell, and they fell hard. You know, those, those are the very public cases. There's also been some more local cases. In the 18 years that I've been a pastor here in western Pennsylvania, I have seen two pastors fall. One for propositioning a minor, the other for embezzling church funds. They started out good and took a tragic turn to the bad a theme that runs throughout the Bible, is that God can take flawed human beings and use them for holy purposes despite themselves. When most people read our Bible lesson today, what they do? They end up focusing on Elijah's God sighting, his theophany. Like the prophet Moses before him, Elijah has a close encounter with God and lives. Moses, he got to see God's back as God walked by up on Mount Sinai. Elijah gets to hear God's gentle whisper as God emerges from the sheer silence up on Mount Horeb. All right, just so you know, Sinai and Horeb are actually two different names for the exact same mountain. These theophanies affirm each man as being a prophet a human spokesperson for the Lord God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and earth. 
But what caught my attention this week as I reread this story was Elijah's state of mind. When he sees fire come down from heaven and consume the altar, what does he do? In his zeal, Elijah orders 450 prophets of the God by all put to be put to death. But when he hears that Jezebel files, uh, vows to kill him for killing them, that's when he turns and runs for his life. He tightails it out of Samaria, heads south down to Beersheba in Ju Judea, and then a day's journey out into the wilderness. I checked it out. That's like 80 or 90 miles. Can you imagine running 80 or 90 miles? He's literally running for his life. Then he gets there, and that's why what it is that he does next just doesn't quite add up to me. When he finally collapses in the heap underneath that broom tree or broom bush, he pleads with God. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life. He's been running for his life, and now he prays to God to let him die. Elijah has reached the breaking point. He's reached the point uh, that uh, he's at the end of his proverbial rope, and he's pleading to be allowed to let go. He has reached the point of holy despair. Game over, lights out, it's finished. He's fought the good fight, he's defended the faith. It was all up to him. Now Elijah's the only one left. Where is he? But the truth is, we can con ourselves into believing or thinking that we're vital to God. But God gives strength to the weak. When you've gone as far as you can go, when you find yourself bone tired and mind is fried, when your energy is sapped, your nerves are shot, you need a rest. You need a helper, a companion, a savior. Wait, if that describes where you're at, then you've reached the point of holy despair. You've become weary from doing what's right. That's when you need to remember another nugget of wisdom, not one of those from Israel's ancient sages, but from Jesus of Nazareth, the very Son of God, the Redeemer of all creation. This is in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heaven burdens, and I will give you rest. Take, your, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A yoke. That's an interesting contraption. Most of us really don't think much about those things these days. That's because we, we don't use oxen to plow fields, and we don't ride around in horse-drawn coaches. A yoke is a collar that's used to distribute the load among a pair, a, a pair of beasts of burden. You can use a yoke with a pair of horses, or of donkeys, or of cattle, or even of elephants. Okay, has anybody here ever been to a horse-pulling contest? Okay, there's at least a few people. I had a couple. By the way, I'm amazed how deprived most of you have been. If you've never been to a horse pool, you need to go to one. All right? So, in a horse pool, uh, you, you hook a team of draft horses to a very heavy sled, and then you measure how far it is they can pull it. But you have to have a pair of horses that are equally yoked. That means that you have to have a team of draft horses who are of similar size, build, strength, and even temperament. Okay, you couldn't take a, a Belgium draft horse and, and yoke it together with a scrawny quarter horse and expect to get very far. By the way, the sled would just go off track and start going round and round is what would happen. How can you ever be equally yoked with Christ? The simple answer is, you can't. Jesus makes your yoke easy and your burden life light by doing both sides of the work. The power of God that is in Christ becomes the power of God that's in you. Christ comes alongside you and gives you his strength 
so that together you can do that good that he's done. Elijah thought he was all alone. Two times in our Bible lesson today, he commanded, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. Elijah is convinced that he's all alone in his quest. But as, a great, as great a man of faith as Elijah was, he's making the all-too-human mistake of underestimating God. He has forgotten that what is impossible for us is always possible for God. God always has a contingency plan for every possible eventuality. What we need to remember is God is God, and we are not. Now, if you were to read just a few verses beyond the end of our Bible lesson today, you would learn an interesting fact that it's obvious that, that Elijah had no inkling of. In 1 Kings 19, verse 18, we learn that God has preserved 7,000 people from the nation of Israel whose Jezebel has not seduced into worshiping Baal. This is what, uh, what it says. All the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. That's those 7,000. So Elijah really wasn't all alone. God had preserved 7,000 others with faith just like his. You're not all alone either. It was this time of year, 18 years ago. I had just finished my first year in seminary, and I was waiting for a phone call from my district superintendent to tell me if he had a church for me to serve. I had no idea uh, when he would be calling, and I certainly didn't know then that when he called, it wasn't going to be one church, it was going to be two. At that point in life, I had preached exactly two sermons in my life. Both of them had been part of a preaching class that I had just finished. Back then, and I can tell you even today, I'm terrified of preaching. It's not delivering sermons that I find particularly hard, is preparing them. This is how the, the usual pattern goes. I, I look at the scripture for the week, and I look at it, and I have absolutely nothing to say. I, I, I find my mind blank. I'm at that point of despair. Like Elijah, I've actually had this thought. But, you know, just go ahead and let me die, okay? It would be easier. But each week, for a long time now, I'm not sure. It's been over 500 sermons now. God keeps showing up and seems to have something to say. I can tell you, the reality is it's a very humbling experience. I mean, uh, Howard can tell you that. John back there can tell you that, too. Now, Elijah thought he was all alone. Oops. This is what happens when these things suddenly go bonkers up here. It's back. All right. I, I've never met anybody who actually feels qualified when it comes to doing something for God. You know why? Because none of us really are. But you know what happens? God keeps showing up and honors our willingness to serve despite all of our inadequacies. We're coming up on summer. This is supposed to be a time when, you know, things can slow down a little bit. Maybe we'll get a vacation. Of course, I'm coming up on retirement. That's what that's supposed to be, too. The only thing I can tell you, I am busier at the moment than I have ever been. I suspect the same is probably true for at least some of you. By the way, I'm afraid retirement's going to be just as busy from what I'm seeing already. <clears throat> What's I say? I, I know a lot of you are in that same boat. Borrowing some words from the Apostle Paul, this is from the, his letters to those believers in Galatia and Philippi. Let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. It is through the songs of faith that God ends up speaking to us most clearly. 
especially when we find ourselves at those points of life that we're in holy despair. There's an old hymn. I know you know it. I know some of you even know who wrote it. Okay? Uh, that, that we're going to do in just a moment. I'm, I'm hoping that these words end up echoing through your mind throughout the rest of the day and on throughout the rest of the week, especially when you're feeling tired. You know the hymn. It's in times like these. We're going to do our best. We're going to sing just a, a piece of it together. In times like these, we need a Savior. In times like these, we need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. We're very sure, we're very sure. Our anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Our human frailties, they're all too obvious. None of us is ever really up to the task at hand. The point of holy despair is always staring us right in the face. But all thanks be to God. God does give strength to the weak. As you go racing through life, remember the caution flag is always out. Life is best lived in humility. Yes, remember, confidence begins with the word con. We're perfectly capable of conning ourselves into believing whatever it is we want to believe. But the truth is that we can con ourselves into thinking that we're vital to God. Our ministry meets with some success. The next thing you know, we all start to begin to think that we're God's gift to humanity. All I can say is when the mighty fall, they fall hard. But all thanks be to God. God does give strength to the weak. Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. When you've reached the point of holy despair, grip onto the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for coming alongside of us and easing our burdens in life. Because of your love, we've been set free. Amen. Closing hymn today is, Here I Am, Lord. Uh, the words are up on the screen. We're going to be singing all three verses, Here I Am, Lord.
they despair, then grasp onto Jesus, the solid rock. Go forth knowing that you can indeed do all things through Jesus the Christ who gives you strength. God's people said, Amen. Amen.